going to be a very interesting hour, validating many things we've been talking about secondhand and anecdotally for years and years, about the imposter in chief, the man occupying the Oval Office. Who is he? Who was he? And for the first time, someone who actually went to high school with this guy has stepped forward to tell her story of what it was like to be around Barry Satoro, now Barack Hussein Obama, and what he was like for real, not as the fictional stories of his young years were laid out to tell us. Her name is Mia Pope. Uh, she is uh, a remarkably courageous woman. She is a Christian, and she was on Pastor James David Manning's program, oh, I don't know, a week or so ago, and I was able to, to get that video, and I posted it for all of you to look at. And Pastor Manning was kind enough to uh, set this up tonight so she could come on this program and speak directly to all of you. And I'm very grateful for that, Mia. Thank you for being here. Oh, thanks, Jeff, for having me on. Um, yeah, I'm I'm happy to give the story. Uh, you know, I think uh, we as Americans, we need to get some clarity about some things, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to clear up what I am able to clear up. Um, one thing, just to uh, stipulate uh, that I did not attend Punahou with Barry Sotoro. I was a girl in the neighborhood uh, in 77, 78, part of 79, and I only ran across him during the summertime. Sure. When he but, would be uh, yeah. out of school and I would be out of school. Yeah. So, um, you know, just to be specific about that, because I'm hoping that other people from Punahou and, and the neighborhood will pop yeah. up and substantiate some of this. So, I, you know, I don't want them to feel right. like, well, wait a minute, she didn't go to Punahou. But, well, um, what I meant to say, and I should have been more specific, was that you went to school at the same time in the same neighborhood and knew him that way. And that's that's fine. And maybe somebody from Punahou will step forward. First of all, let's let's talk just for fun about Punahou. Um, he he entered Punahou under very unusual circumstances, according to tradition. Did he not? Yeah, the, that's right. The, the school is over a hundred years old. It's an old missionary school, and um, it's it's one of very few in the country. I'd say a handful of uh, preparatory type academies in the country. Uh huh. That's not only extremely expensive, but the admissions process is quite selective, and you might see some of these types of schools on the East Coast, and those familiar with that would maybe understand the incredible hoops that you have to jump through to get into these schools. Yeah. But one of the um, one of the characteristics of Punahou, of which I'm aware of, is that they really will only take you from kindergarten. You, and there's you, a whole yeah. rationale behind that. In, in Barry Sotoro's case, uh, from what, you know, if we can believe anything, but it, it, he was supposedly, uh, what, 10 years old, so that would put him at about the fifth grade or maybe 11 years old in the sixth grade. Uh -huh. They wouldn't want a student coming in at that age simply because a child that age would bring other influences, their experiences and that sort of thing. And, you know, if you have a rogue kid in there, you know, it can kind of infect the other kids. So there's like a... They have this kind of a philosophy where they really kind of prefer to groom you from kindergarten on. Understand? So, and there's yeah. there's a waiting list to get into that. School. Yeah. There's no shortage yeah. of students. So if you figure that each one of those classes is full, so for Barry to have just waltzed into Punahou like that, and I'm just giving my testimony and those who know Punahou, and I, you know, certainly know a lot of people there. Yeah. I've, I've even yeah. had a couple of boyfriends that have come from Punahou. Mm -hmm. And um, it's un really an unheard of thing. And so, uh, you know, if, if, if I'm just saying, I, you know, I, I'll bet a dollar that it has never happened before, and it has never happened since. Now, that's my testimony. Well, I would, I, I would think you're quite right. I do know people who have gone there myself over the years, and they've described yeah. a similar profile. It's very expensive too, and these are 1970s dollars. What, what was it? Uh, what did it cost to a month ago there? Yeah, it was. It, it, I mean, late. Like I last time I heard a figure on Prunaho was in the middle nineties, and mm -hmm. it was over of about nine hundred dollars for kindergarten at that time a month. That's right. Yeah, and if I remember, a month, folks, a month. Just so yeah. You get so this is in like ninety four mm -hmm. that I recall because I had my. Well, I'm sorry, I had my nieces 
coming to live with me in Hawaii, and so I thought I might try to see if I could do some because they were that age, four and five years old. Right. So I I was pricing things. So that was the latest figure that I have. But um, remembering back in the day, I think it was something like you know as much as six or seven hundred dollars a month for even some well, of these dollars. That's a lot of money. You can multiply that yeah. by three, I'm sure, yeah. by now. So yeah. It, it, yeah. yeah, not cheap. Okay. So the I- the idea of uh, Hawaii. Uh, summer vacation, uh, people hanging out. Uh, it, it's not a huge area. Everybody kind of knew everybody that was socially active, right. I guess, and, and that's how you got to know uh, Barry. Um, right. you, you knew the fast lane types. You knew the uh, the uh, socially mobile types. How would you describe uh, his overall position in the young people's community? These are 15, 16, yeah. 17-year-old kids. Yeah. Um, he floated around amongst us. There was a there was over ten of us and less than twenty of us, you know, interacting from you know throughout. I didn't see Barry every single day, but I certainly saw, saw a lot of them. So he was and in your little peer on, group. You had a little peer group, and right. he was in that group. Okay. Yeah, he was. He was more, I'd say, on the periphery. Barry had a, a type of personality where he might have some acquaintance for a while, but he seemed to just either make that person mad at them, burn them off, or he, he was, he, 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 just like today, you see that, that usury type of personality. He was either, you know, bumming money, bumming cigarettes. Oh, he's a taker. Something off of you. He's yeah, a taker. taker. Yeah. And so what would happen is he would wear out that emotional uh, friendliness, you know, the reservoir of affection would easily dry up with him. Uh-huh. So he would kind of float you know, float around a bit. And so I would say that Barry really wasn't a beloved member of our peer group. He, but And another thing is, the even us kids, and we weren't naive kids, basically, right? Like, you know, knuckleheads like all, you know, most teenagers. Mm-hmm. But even we could tell about his pathological lying, and he would just, you know, he'd just tire you out. Okay, so just, he'd come on with his, his, his charm, his flashy smile. Yeah. Uh, I guess... Most of you were were uh, smoking a little bit of weed back then. Oh it yeah, I, I've never done prevalent. cocaine in my life, but mm-hmm. I've definitely smoked and inhaled Pacalolo in the seventies for mm-hmm. sure. Mm-hmm. And I even held it in for a second or two before exhaling. My goodness! But, um, right. Yeah, I know. You definitely don't want to waste that stuff. I, you know, but I, I wa- somehow I wound up staying out of the the uh, hardcore drug scene myself. Uh, you know, and I don't know miracle that why that was the case. Okay. But, um, but it was all around me, and right. there were certainly people around me that did harder drugs. Now, let's talk about Barry's sexual orientation then. Yeah. Uh, I understand that you and your peer group uh, knew full well that even then he was uh, at least bisexual, if not full, fully homosexual. How did, right. how did, you, how did you assay that, and, and, and what did your friends think of that in your group? It, okay, you're, you're, we're looking at 77, 78, 79. This is mm-hmm. four AIDS. Uh, gay was a raging concept. It was uh, not really. It was like somewhat avant-garde, perhaps, to be gay. There was. Uh, was it kind of cool? It was kind of cool. Huh. It was All kind right. of cool. If you think, um, you know, I, I refer to the Studio Fifty Four mentality type crowd, but yeah. It was cool. Remember, AIDS is the thing that put the wet blanket on the gay community. Sure did. And that hadn't happened yet. No, it started and in uh, 76, 77 in the hepatitis B vaccine program, and, and that was... Yeah. Yeah, okay. And we really didn't see the AIDS on the scene until 80 or 81. That's right. As far as, you know, the, the diagnosable type, you know, mystery of food mm-hmm. and so forth. But, um, and then remember that uh, co- uh, the crack, I mean, excuse yeah, the crack wasn't invented yet, or at least it wasn't in the islands. So no, people were was, were snorting cocaine, but they right. they weren't cooking it and smoking it as crack. That just that just didn't happen. Didn't happen at that time, right? But there was a thing going on. Um, it was called freebasing, and what they would do is cocaine in, was in the powder form, and so I guess obviously it's cut with something, mm-hmm. and so it was a more intense high when they would take some baking soda and a little water and heat it up. And then the baking soda would appease to whatever the thing was cut with, you know, like lactose or whatever the heck they're cutting the thing with. 
Yeah. So it would give you like flakes of the actual pure cocaine. That's little, how you could separate the cut with the, yeah. from the real cocaine. Little and chunks. And then they'd stick that in the pipe and smoke it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's what Barry seemed to like to do. I'm not saying he never sm- sorted. Uh, he may very well have. But I'm just saying did you guys Did you guys see him do this? Yeah. You know, I, I'll tell you what I did see. I, you know, I'm going back what 36 years. That's okay. Years, we understand. Years. Yeah. So I'm, you know, I'm doing. Um, but I recall Barry's lips used to get really dark. I mean, like three or four or five shades darker than the rest of his face. Now, there's a physiological reason for that. The cocaine residue restricts the blood flow to the tissue. Uh-huh. So when a person of color does that, the, the lips get uh, kind of purplish. Darker. Yeah. Kind of purplish, right? Mm-hmm. And so uh, I remember that, <laughs> see, Barry's kind of convenient like that. He wears a sign for you when he's hitting the pie part. So uh, he, I remember we could always look at him and go, ah, Barry, hitting the pipe. <laughs> because there are times when his lips will be a relative similar color to the rest of his face. Mm-hmm. And then when he's hitting the old pipe, his lips get really dark. Looking at him now, uh, Mia Pope, uh, do you see evidences of uh, cosmetic surgery to his nose, or his uh, were his lips made any smaller? There's been talk you, about that. Yeah, you know what I can tell you is that I think Barry has either had his teeth tapped or had some veneers put on. Okay. Because his teeth weren't crooked, but um, they but weren't his, perfect his like they are teeth, now. Yeah. Right, they weren't that denture perfect like they are now. And if I recall, I think his incisors that'd be like. The equivalent of a canine. Uh-huh. Know, they, yeah. I think I re- they stuck out more. So I All think right. that he's had some, at least what I can recognize is I think he's done something to his All face. right. Well, that's not anything to, to damn anybody about in this day and age. No. Okay. He's right. a politician. He's a celebrity. And just, you don't believe me, right. just ask him, folks. Uh, right, right. Okay. So we, we have no question about drug use. None. No, Marijuana, and, 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 pot. and then yeah. I mean he he really was pretty open because remember it was like a status symbol. I got if it. You, if you were to obtain it, it was it it meant you had money, you had cash. But we knew because of his bragging that he was actually getting with these other gay guys, okay. homosexual men, and that's how he was obtaining the cocaine. Remember, this, he's this, bro, he's broke like we are. He's bum and changed to buy cigarettes or bum and cigarettes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And yet so, he's got this coke. Okay, so he's got the now, coke, right. uh, what were there other young uh, gays in your group beside Barry, or was he pretty much it? Um, I'll tell you, it are you know how these circles, you know, you have the people you usually hang out with the most. Like say there was ten, you know, more than ten, less than twenty of us. And sure. yes, there were some young gay uh, guys mm-hmm. of which I got along beautifully with. You mm-hmm. know, as a female, right, non-threatening mm-hmm. kind of thing. You know, sure. And I, um, you know, I, you know, I was always like friends with the fat girls and the gay guys and that sort of thing. Which, you know, whatever. But um, yeah, uh, there was, was, was there was, was some there was some gay. Yeah, there was. Was some Barry gay, part? Least, were, did Barry they hang out experimentally? Did they hang out together, the gays, Barry and the others? Yeah, I mostly I saw Barry Sotoro get out of cars with older guys. All right, that's where I'm going I next. I saw him cavorting yeah. with older gay men. There was a place on Cujillo Avenue. It's spelled K U H I O Cujillo Avenue, mm-hmm. and it was located near where Hamburger Mary's is. So, if any local people are listening, and that would be in Waikiki, there used to be a place. Now, I'm at 14, 15, and 16. I still look like a baby, so you would have carded me immediately. I never could get into this place. Mm-hmm. I don't remember what it's called, but maybe some people from Hawaii can, rem- you know, jog my memory of what this place was called. But anyway, um, but Barry, he was already like 16, 17, and he would dress up in his little, you know, funky, disco, G-stringy looking. You, you've seen the pictures of him in drag, haven't you, Jeff? Yeah. So yeah, he'd okay. actually so he dress, the, the he'd, okay, he'd dress like that and he'd go to this place and, and interface right. with these guys. And they were, right. they were grown men. 